It is time for us to begin. Um, so we've started a new quarter in this class. And Mike started us off last week discussing hard passages of the Bible. Brother Mike introduced this study last week and looked at passages regarding women and salvation. They shall be saved through childbearing. And uh, if you were here, you got to hear that, and he did a good job. I enjoyed that lesson. I want to offer some further introductory remarks as I get into my line of study this evening. There are three passages in the Bible, in the New Testament, that affirm that there are certain passages of Scripture, certain passages that the Bible itself classifies as hard passages. I want to return for just a minute to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. Mike introduced this last week. In that passage, the apostle Peter states about our beloved brother Paul, who wrote according to the grace given him. He says this about his writings. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of Scripture. First of all, I find it interesting that even an apostle himself considered some things in the Bible hard to understand. Well, I feel like if Peter thought that some things were hard to understand, I don't have to apologize if I think that some things are hard to understand. But I will note this, that he did not say they were impossible to understand. I don't think that there is anything in the Bible that is impossible to understand. Although certain things in the Bible are not fully understood by us, we can understand the basic message that God is trying to tell us. The Bible would not have been given to men if it were not under the presumption that man could understand it. But we recognize this truth. Some things are hard to understand. Certainly the book of Revelation is harder to understand than the book of Ephesians. We would probably all agree with that. I think the book of Romans is harder to understand than the book of Acts. But let me give you this principle. I think this is important. I think it's important that we understand this. The Bible is easiest to understand when it comes to matters pertaining to salvation and getting to heaven. God has made those issues so easy to understand. So when it comes to getting to heaven, when it comes to the matter of salvation, it is not hard. And it is unfortunate that our denominational friends have made it so very muddy. And so very difficult for people to find the truth. Now, the harder something is to understand, what I've experienced in Scripture is the less likely it has to do with your salvation. God has made it easy to get to heaven. That's the point that I want to make. And that's a principle I think is important for us to understand. Some things are hard in the Bible to understand because they're hard to interpret. Some things are hard, not so much because they're hard to understand, but because they're hard to follow. Some things in the Bible, many things in Scripture, go against our human nature, go against our grain, where we actually have to submit ourselves, have to change our will to match God's will. Some things in the Bible are just hard to follow. In the Gospel of John chapter 6, Jesus made the statement that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't enjoy eternal life. And because of that saying, some turned away, the Bible said, stopped following him, saying, this is a hard saying. Who can receive it? So there are some things that go against us. There are two categories of passages that throughout this series we're going to be looking at. Things that are hard 
to understand because we have to interpret the Bible. Some things that are hard to obey. Why is it that some things are hard to understand? Well, there's a passage in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11 where the inspired writer was writing to these brethren. And he's writing to them. They're on the verge of going back to the law of Moses. They're on the verge of apostasy. And he's writing them about this problem that they're about to abandon Christianity. He says to them, There are many things I'd like to say to you, but I can't because they are hard to interpret. And then he says this, And you are dull to hear. (laughs) Well, how do you like that? (laughs) Sometimes things are hard to understand because we ought to be mature enough in Christ to be able to study the Bible and get to the bottom of what the Bible is saying. This is why Paul told Timothy, study to show thyself approved to God, a worker that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so here is the reality that some things are hard because we have not applied ourselves. We have not studied like we should. That's the design of this class, to look at passages that might be difficult, that might be hard, and then to give some principles that will help us to study on our own and understand God's word. There are those passages that are actually hard to understand. There are those reasons that make them hard. Other reasons that sometimes are outside of our control is this, that there are certain idioms in the Bible that come from the ancient world that we're not familiar with. And that might make a passage hard to understand. It may be that there is a problem in translation from the original Hebrew or the Greek into the English, and therefore something has been lost in the translation process, and that makes it difficult sometimes for us to understand a passage. It could be that a passage is shrouded in symbolism. Again, we go back to the book of Revelation, right? The book has great many symbols that represent spiritual ideas in that book. Now, that's harder to understand as opposed to a historical narrative like the book of Acts. Therefore, the nature of the language, whether it be poetical or apocalyptic, creates difficulty in understanding a text. Those are some of the reasons, I think, why people might find passages hard to understand. Now, there is the other category that we're not going to get into tonight, but that idea that a passage may be hard because it goes against us. It goes against our grain. We have teachings on marriage and divorce. We have moral teachings that sometimes those go against what we want. And they make it hard for us to obey them. And so it's a hard passage in that regard. We'll look at those at another time. Tonight, I want to turn to the book of Exodus. So let me direct our attention back to the Old Testament, chapter 4. Actually, in chapter 3 and 4... We have the Lord speaking to Moses out of the burning bush in the region of Mount Sinai. As you recall, just to give us a little bit of background here, for 40 years Moses had gone into this region of Moriah that we could call probably a period of training. He was getting prepared, or God was preparing him, for the task that he would assign to him in bringing the children out of the land of bondage. Moses didn't feel like he was up to the task. He even told the Lord as much, this is not for me, Lord. And the Lord told him, well, don't worry, I'll send with you Aaron, and he'll be your spokesman. And so God encouraged him in a rather forceful way that you're going to go do this. And Moses said, okay. In chapter 4 and verse 18 and following, we read this. Moses went back to Jethro, this was his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. You'll recall that Moses had 
killed a man back in Egypt and he was a wanted man. Well, the Lord's telling them, those folks are dead, go on back. So Moses took his wife and his son, had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. Now, we remember that staff, don't we? I'll tell everything. That staff, what did it do? It was something special about that staff. It turned into a snake. That's not a normal staff. And when he'd pick it back up, it would turn back into a staff. He tells Moses in verse 21, Then the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. Look at what he says here. Now this is interesting. He says this, and this is going to be the text we're going to look at. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. I'm going to ask you a question. Did God hold Pharaoh accountable for the things that he did? I see a lot of heads shaking. Yes, yes he did. Yes, God did hold Pharaoh accountable for his conduct. Many people ask this question, well, how can that be? In fact, there's a New Testament passage that even reflects on this idea. How can that be? God himself said that he would harden Pharaoh's heart. So we have God who's going to create a condition in the man that is wrong and then hold him accountable for that very thing that God created in him. Does this sound right. There's something off here. Isn't God just? Yes. Is God fair? Yes, He is. Well, how do we harmonize this passage with what we know about God? Now, let me give you some information that I think is interesting. Um, And then with this information, you can go back and do your own study if you want. Between Exodus chapter 4 and Exodus chapter 14, it is said 20 times that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Now, 10 times it is said that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And 10 times it is said that Pharaoh hardened his heart. I can give you the 20 passages, but if you want them, just let me know. I'll text them or email them to you. Now, we know that the Bible does not contradict itself, right? We we all agree with that. Yeah, I agree. The Bible does not contradict itself. So there must have been some way that we can reconcile both of these ideas where God hardened Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardened his heart. How can that be? How do we bring these two conflicting accounts into harmony with one another. Some would consider this a hard passage. First, we need to acknowledge something, I think, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and I believe that he did. He did not do it arbitrarily or capriciously, and he certainly didn't do it malevolently, right? God is not that kind of being. First of all, God doesn't do anything arbitrarily, does he? God always has a have a plan and he has a reason for everything he does. Well, in what way or in what sense did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Any ideas? Well, how about this? He hardened Pharaoh's heart by making demands upon him that he did not want to hear. Moses was commanded to go to the Pharaoh and say this, Thus thus saith Jehovah God, let my people go. And do you know what Pharaoh said? Pharaoh said this, Who is Jehovah that I should fear him? Well, he was about to get an introduction, wasn't he? But who is Jehovah that I should fear him? If only Pharaoh had not resisted the command of God in his heart, would he have hardened his heart? No, he wouldn't. If he'd have said, okay, go on. 
If he would have listened to the demand that God put on him or the command that God put on him, he would have never hardened his heart. But he didn't. A person, now think about this, a person can resist the commandments of God so vehemently, so often that it becomes virtually impossible for them to respond to that message positively. They have hardened their hearts and set themselves against the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, this is an ever-present danger. I'm going to tell you, folks, this is a present danger, not just for the alien sinner, but for God's people as well. We can do this. Let me share a passage with you. And it's found in the New Testament. It's in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. I'm going to read the whole context because it's worth reading. You just follow along with me. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. It says this, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house is more, has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house... If indeed we hold fast our, con our confidence and our boasting in our hope. I always think of this passage when I think of what the Lord said concerning John the baptizer. Of those born of women, there has not arisen one greater than John the baptizer. But he who is least in the kingdom is greater than John. Why? Because we have the adoption as sons and daughters. We are his house. If we hold, look at that word if, if we hold our confession. He goes on, he says this. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, here it is. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. Now he's going to explain what the rebellion is here. On the day of testing in the wilderness... Where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Well, what did they see for 40 years? Well, they were fed from heaven. Their clothes did not wear out. You see me in this suit in 10 years, I guarantee you it'll have some wears and tears in it. But their clothes didn't wear out. And for 40 years, this was the situation. And they still... Put God to the test. He said, they saw, my, they saw what I did for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with great, uh, with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they will not enter into my rest. Now, why does the Hebrew writer say that? He says that for us. Look what he says in verse 12. Take care, brothers. Now he's talking to these brethren who are getting ready to leave Christ and go back to the law of Moses. Take care. The word there really is take heed. It's blepo. It means watch out. Watch out, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. What's he saying? Here's the practical lesson that I learned from this. What I learned from Pharaoh. And that's this. I can say no to God and harden my heart against Him. I can do that even as the child of God. When I hear the commandments of God, how do I respond to them? Oh no, Lord, <laughs> that's too much. When I hear the preacher say, gambling's wrong. Oh, wait a minute, that's, that's my favorite. When I hear the preacher say, you should not drink, that's a sin. Alcohol is a sin. Oh, wait a minute, I just, I just want to kick back a few. Is that all right? 
What is my attitude towards the teaching of God, His commands? And I'll tell you what, when we say no to God, enough times, forcefully enough, we harden ourselves to those instructions and we can't hear them anymore. And even though we are God's children, we are walking dead. Does that sound right to you? That is a teaching of the Word of God. He is the author of eternal salvation to those who obey Him. And I have never seen a command in the New Testament where God has said, you can go ahead and not worry about that one. Not one time. The church is going to be challenged, and has been, but it will continue to be challenged in the years to come to put off the moral integrity that we have had. Pressure will be put on us to accept sin after sin after sin. And some of us might. But when we hear the commandment of God, do not harden your hearts, the Word of God says, like they did back in the rebellion. What happened? The Bible says that thousands of people died in a single day. God's not saying that just to scare us. He's letting us know that He will be true to His own teachings, even if we're not. So today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. This is how God hardened Pharaoh's heart, by putting commands in front of him that he didn't like, commands that he did not want to obey, and so he put them off. He didn't obey them. He could have obeyed them. He could have obeyed them the first time God gave them to him. But he didn't. And he went through. Now how many different times did God tell him? Ten times. Didn't he? Was God long suffering with him? Yes he was. Ten different times. God tried to convince that evil king. Listen to me. Ten times he said, no, no, no. And he hardened his heart. Now, I said at the beginning of this lesson that there are other reasons that are sometimes difficult to understand Scripture, certain passages. And I use this word, idioms. Does everybody know what an idiom is? Does anybody know what an idiom is? An idiom is... A figure of speech that is a method of expression, expressing an idea that is particular to a specific culture or a place or a language. If a young man goes and asks a girl out, and she says no, we say, well, he struck out, <laughs> right? Well, we all know what that means, don't we? <laughs> but other cultures may not. They may not be familiar with that idiom that we use. There is a Hebrew idiom in the Bible that represents God as doing something that in fact he only permits. Brother Wayne Jackson, I can't remember what he called He had a special name for this. He made up his own name for this word. Uh, and I forget what it, I think it was the idiom, I think he called it the idiom of permission. Jared will let me know if I'm wrong. <laughs> Jared is Wayne's son. Well, I'll give you an idea of what I mean. Tina and I were traveling this past weekend to uh, South Carolina. We went to the uh, South Carolina men's, well, I did. She didn't. She stayed at the hotel. But we went to this uh, fellowship there. And on the way, it's a four-hour drive, so we stopped and we got some snacks. And I got these almonds. And they were covered with this chocolate. But it was like a lemon kind of covering. I love lemon. Tina hates it. And I asked her, I said, do you want some of this, honey? She said, yes. I was surprised. And I knew right then, she doesn't know what this is. <laughs> so I gave it to her. And she popped it in her mouth. And she looked at me and said, why would you do that? I said, I didn't do anything. <laughs> but she knew I knew. And I got in trouble for it. <laughs> but... What is she trying to say? She said, I did something in this process. Really, what I did was allow something to unfold, didn't I? Yes. Well, that's kind of what this Hebrew idiom is about. It represents God as doing something that he only permits to take place. 
Let's take a look at a passage. We can look at a couple, but for time's sake, I don't, we won't get into too deep, deeply into either one of these. But if you go to Jeremiah chapter 4, we'll look at it. The major mission of Jeremiah was to proclaim the coming Babylonian invasion. The children of Israel had sinned. They rebelled against God. God had made a pronouncement that you're going to go away into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. That evil Nebuchadnezzar is going to come. He's going to invade the southern kingdom of Judah and take you all away. That's found in Jeremiah 25. Well, Jeremiah's mission was to go and tell the people, hey, they're coming and don't resist. When they get here, just throw your hands up and say, we surrender. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> he told the children of Israel, or the, uh, the children of Judah this. He told them, listen, the southern kingdom of Judah, it's going to fall. So don't resist or it's going to be disaster. Well, they abused him in so many horrible ways when you read Jeremiah. Well, in chapter 4 and verse 10... Now, let me give you this too. Jeremiah was giving this prophecy that they're coming and they're going to destroy you. Well, others showed up. They were false prophets. And they were telling the people, don't worry. God's not going to leave us. He's on our side. It's going to be perfectly fine. Well, in chapter 4 and verse 10, this is what the text says. Then I said, as Jeremiah speaking, Ah, Lord God, surely... You have utterly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying, It shall be well with you, whereas the sword has reached their very life. Now hold on a minute here. This does not sound very consistent with the character of God, does it? Does God deceive people? What's, the, what's, what's another word for deception? Lying. Does God lie? Does God lead people into deceptions? No, he does not. At the time that Jeremiah was prophesying this, there were false prophets going around saying, it's going to be just fine. But God does not actively deceive anybody. God did not lie to them. Jeremiah did not lie. In fact, the Bible says that God cannot lie. Yet Jeremiah the prophet says, Jehovah, surely you have greatly deceived these people. It's kind of like what Tina said to me. Why'd you do that? <laughs> well, Jeremiah didn't actually deceive the people at all, did he? No, he did not. But when the false prophets rose and they started telling the people what they wanted to hear, they wanted to believe it. They didn't want the message of God. That was too hard. They wanted the message from the false teachers. And you know what God did? He stood back and let them. When they were inclined to disobey God, when, when they were inclined to reject His words, God said, fine. So when God saw that the people were inclined to believe a false message, He did not stand in their way. He didn't put a blocker from them say, no, 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 wait a minute. They're lying to you. God didn't do that. They had a true prophet of God, and they rejected Him. So God didn't throw a roadblock in their way. So the people asked, why did you do that? What did you do to us? You can add to this Ezekiel chapter 20, 25 through 26. Without going into the context and reading it, there's a context there where the children of Israel had gotten so... Or actually, this is the, I keep saying the children of Israel, but... Technically, this is the, the citizens of Judah, right? The southern kingdom. They'd gone into Babylonian captivity. And one of the reasons they had gone there was because of this gross sin that they were engaged in. They were rejecting God's commands. And they got so bad that they started even sacrificing their own children. And in this context, God says that I gave you statutes. That we're not good. Wait a minute, God, what are you saying? Those were not actually statutes that God gave, but the people saw this teaching, saw this false teaching, and they rather have it. 
than what God had said. And so God says, I gave you false teachings. I allowed you to have this so that you went in to rebellion. Well, just like Pharaoh, God permitted him to harden his heart. God is not going to stand in his way. God is not going to stand in my way if I am so inclined to reject God's laws and pick other laws for myself. And that's the way this idiom works. Let me tell you, this understanding, this simple little Hebrew idiom will resolve so many difficulties in the Bible. Let me give you an application. So you've got on one hand, we can respond to God's commands in such a way that we harden ourselves against God's commands. In other words, well, there's the command. I don't believe it. I don't want it. I'm going to resist it. On the other hand, we can replace those commands with a set of our own commands and say, I like these better. In either case, God is not going to stand in our way, slam the door closed, say, oh, I'm not going to let you do that. No, he'll let us do that. God will not interfere with our own free will. Now, this is what the denominational world has done with the commands of God, haven't they? They have done both of these. They have looked at the commands of God and said, I resist that. I don't want that. I want this. And some of the things that we see happening in the religious world that oftentimes affect us as well is a rejection of baptism, the role of women in the church, instrumental music. Why? Because there's an idea, there's a desire for what we want. One of the hardest things you will ever do is to take your desires and your will and say, put them right here. God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. I want this, but I know it's wrong. But I'm going to do what you want me to do. Because I want heaven more than that. I always thought it was interesting that we would reject God's command, insert it with our own ideas, And be happy about it thinking we're all fine. The whole goal of this endeavor is to get to heaven, to get back with God. It seems strange to me that we would try and find another method home than what God has supplied us with. So this is what we see so often. There are God's commands and people reject them. Let me give you another passage that we can add to this real quickly. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is discussing the great apostasy. Now, in in, in the first Thessalonian letter, he writes concerning the second coming of Christ. Well, you know what they did? They got jazzed. They were excited. (laughs) They started selling all their goods, and they'd get up on the roof, and they're just waiting. (laughs) We're ready, Lord. Well, he writes 2 Thessalonians... In order to let them know, I didn't mean he was coming tomorrow. I just want you to know he's coming. And then he says this, the second coming of Christ won't happen until the great apostasy takes place first. And the son of perdition, the man of sin, is revealed. And then he describes this man of lawlessness. It's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. I'll read it for you. He describes the man of sin in this way. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends a strong delusion. Well, here we are again. Where God is said to do something that sounds like it's against his character. But notice what we just read. Because they refuse to love the truth. God sends them a strong delusion that they may be believe what is false in order that all may be condemned. Look at here. He describes them again. Who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Will you take a look at these folks? They didn't love the truth. Guess what? I'm going to tell you this. If you don't love the truth, and you're not willing to ingest the truth and take it into your life, guess what? You're going to take something else in. And you know what it's going to be? It's going to be a lie. 
And God's not going to stand in your way. God's going to allow it to happen. There's accountability right here. When I come to the Word of God, that I recognize that it's holy. It is to be revered. It is the very Word of Almighty who created us and the universe. And so I need to hear Him and respond to Him in obedience. He will not stand. You see how this idiom helps to explain even this passage. And there are a lot of passages we can add to this. But we're not going to tonight. But there are plenty that would be resolved by this simple idea. This is such an important biblical principle. Understanding this simple principle helps us understand the Bible. Think about this one. I'll add one more. The model prayer. What is the model prayer? Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, he goes down through it. Then he says this. Lead us not into temptation. And that's an active voice. What does he mean? Lead us not into... Does God lead people into temptation? Well, James says this, let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Again, we can apply this same Hebrew idiom, this Bible parlance, really. If God does not tempt man, why would we pray then, lead us not into temptation? If we were to put it into a modern day parlance, we'd say this, Lord, don't allow me to be overcome by temptation. Don't allow me to be overcome by temptation. Is that consistent with Scripture? Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with all the temptations, He will also provide a way of escape. And so that's what this text is really saying. It's not that God leads us there. It's that God will not stand in our way. But He also is the source of help. He will not let me be overcome by temptation in life. He'll provide for me a way to get out of it. And I'll close then with this last passage. Romans chapter 9 verse 17. This is one, and and, and we'll read on through the text. This is one that oftentimes confuses people. He's talking about God's sovereign choices. Does God have the right to make choices in the worlds that he created? He most certainly does. God has the right to say what he's going to do with this creation, including what he's going to do with us. And that's what this chapter is about, God's sovereign choices. In verse 17, it says this, and we'll just read on down through verse 23. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Now look at verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will that, or will what is molded say to the molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? And then he makes this statement. What if God, desiring to show his wrath, And to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Now this is interesting. So the question is this. Wait a minute. If God prepared vessels for wrath, how do we know that we're not one of them? And how can he find fault with them? This is what Paul is answering. In the Greek there is... A voice here that is interesting. And it is either the middle voice or it is the passive voice. W.E. Vine says that this can be middle voice. Well, let me explain to you what that means. Whenever we speak, we have different voices. In English, we have two voices. We have the uh, active voice 
and we have the passive voice. If I were to speak in the active voice, the active voice shows the subject of the sentence as doing the action. It would be like this, I hit the ball. That's the active voice. If it were passive, I might say this, I was hit by the ball. That's the passive, I'm passive in that. The middle voice shows the subject as acting in some way that affects themselves. So if we were to read it like that, we might say this. What if God, desiring to show His wrath and to make known His power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath who have prepared themselves for destruction? That would be them. And guess what? That's consistent with Scripture, isn't it? Who prepares themselves for heaven? We do. God has made the opportunity, but I prepare myself by obedience. Well, how do I prepare myself for destruction? By rejecting God's law. And that's what this passage is saying. God has simply stepped out of the way and allowed certain individuals to prepare themselves for destruction. Let me close now. Let me give a conclusion real quick. (laughs) The last verse that I just read here is really interesting. I won't go into all the things that I looked at when I studied it, but it says, If God, desiring to show His wrath and to make known His power, has endured with much patience. Now I want you to think about this. God has endured with much patience. These vessels of of wrath fitting themselves for destruction. Well, let me ask you this. When Pharaoh rejected God the first time, did he deserve to die? Yes, he did. How about the second time? Yep. God has the right to destroy me for the first solitary sin I commit. But he doesn't. Why not? Because he's long-suffering. God has endured with much patience all of these other vessels of wrath that have fitted themselves for destruction. Why? So that I can get to heaven. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for your patience, for your long-suffering. So that little old me can get into eternity. And those are some of the practical ideas that I think we learn from some of these harder passages in Scripture. Well, thank you so much. I ran a little bit over, but we'll get over.